Welcome to Grace Bible Church Online. Once again, we will be meeting in this unfamiliar format in order to accomplish a familiar thing, to draw near to the Lord, to get into the scriptures, to discover more about our God. So thank you for joining me this way as we begin this process once again. We will now continue through the book of John, the Gospel of John, and move forward each day, each day, not just Sundays, each day, beginning today, moving toward the resurrection, which is April 12th, 2020, and chapter 20 of John. And today we are in John chapter 12. What we are looking at is Jesus living life as a human being, the Word of God become flesh, manifesting what it is like to live the fullness of life, the eternal life here on earth. He is providing us a, a way of doing that. That's why we are beholding Him, observing Him in every situation that He comes into. He will, in this case, be overcoming stress. Uh, the possibility would be great for others. Stress, problems, fear, uh, death. All of those things that people are facing, even today, while people are homebound because of COVID-19, stress, problems, uh, fear, difficulties, all of those things are there, and the possibility of catching the disease and dying is real as well. So this is very helpful information to observe Jesus in these circumstances and to watch how he deals with these things. So come along. Let's look at John chapter 12. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor, he was a thief, and since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him, and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too. For it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. The next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, There's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. Some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration, paid a visit to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. They, they said, Sir, we want to meet Jesus. Philip told Andrew about it, 
and they went together to ask Jesus. Jesus replied, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into His glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to be my disciple must follow me, because my servants must be where I am, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. When the crowd heard the voice, some thought it was thunder, but others declared an angel had spoken to him. Then Jesus told them, the voice was for your benefit, not mine. The time for judging this world has come, when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. The crowd responded, We understood from Scripture that the Messiah would live forever. How can you say the Son of Man will die? Just who is this Son of Man anyway? Jesus replied, My light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can, so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of the light. After saying these things, Jesus went away and was hidden from them. But despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done, most of the people still did not believe in Him. This is exactly what Isaiah the prophet had predicted. Lord, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed His powerful arm? But the people couldn't believe. For as Isaiah also said, the, blind, the Lord has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so that their eyes cannot see and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and have me heal them. Isaiah was referring to Jesus when he said this, because he saw the future and spoke of the Messiah's glory. Many people did believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders, but they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than the praise of God. Jesus shouted to the crowds, If you trust me, you are trusting not only me, but also God who sent me. For when you see me, you are seeing the one who sent me. I have come as a light to shine in this dark world, so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. I will not judge those who hear me, but don't obey me, for I have come to save the world and not to judge it. But all who reject me and my message will be judged on the day of judgment by the truth I have spoken. I, st I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. And I know his commands lead to eternal life, so I say whatever the Father tells me to say. John chapter 12. We are in the midst of Jesus entering into his last week, his time, the triumphal entry on that particular Sunday, Palm Sunday. He is entering into the city in fulfillment of prophecy. He is entering in to, this, to the very place that had been set aside for him from before the foundations of this earth. He was coming to fulfill all that God had intended so that he could bring life, life in a new way, eternal life, life abundant, the, the kingdom of God fulfilled. He's taking on the, the payment of sin. All of those things are going to unfold as we go through this week. But in this particular chapter, chapter 12, we are looking at Jesus overcoming circumstances that are difficult. He is hated by some. He is being betrayed by one of his own, a disciple by the name of Judas. He is uh, 
being surrounded by opportunists, the, the crowd that comes down to Jerusalem with palms shouting, this is the king, this is the new king. Just in case he becomes king, they want to be ready and they want to be able to promote him. By the end of the week, things change. He is in the midst of a group of people, some who believe, some who don't, some who recognize God the Father, recognize Him as God's Son, who recognize Him as the true Messiah, and others who don't. But imagine the possibility of stress in a situation like this. You're trying to accomplish what God has given you to do. There are lots of problems. There are lots of issues. And you are trying to do what God has, has set for you to do and for you to accomplish. And here He is hated. Often when people aren't being accepted by the people around them, they find that difficult. They struggle. Uh, there is a, uh, a willingness to cave in, to compromise, anything to be able to be accepted by other people, to be liked by other people, to be applauded by, by people. And Jesus kept his focus on what really mattered. So this is the way to overcome stress, problems, hatred, fear, uh, even death. Stay close to God. Stay close to God. Jesus has done that all the way through. God the Father is acknowledging him as the one who is, he's already received glory from. He hasn't even gone to the cross. He hasn't been raised from the dead. God the Father has already been glorified. Just by Jesus staying close to him, building that relationship, keeping close, keeping that relationship first, that's loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He is demonstrating that for us so that we can see what it looks like. He is listening to God. He is listening to what he has to say and what direction he would have him go. And he says even how he's supposed to say it. He is communicating with God. He's listening to what God's saying. He's communicating back in prayer. And he obeys what God gives him to do. He's not just assuming He's not making this fit so that everyone else is happy. He is doing what God tells him to do because God's love is so complete and so pure and so perfect that his love, doing things his way, is going to be the most loving thing that Jesus can do for the people around him. So if he really cares about the people, he's going to do what God the Father would have him do. If we love people, we're going to do what God would have us do. That's how this works. we got to love God first with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We follow Him, listen to Him, go where He has us go, do what He has us do, say what He has us to say. Out of that comes love, and that love is, is real and pure and deep and connected with God. It's not just made up. It's not just assumptions. It's not just how we were raised. It's not just our DNA. It's not just our uh, traditions and the ways that we've always done it. This is... This is love at the level that God has designed it. And we can do it with the power that God gives us, with the resources that He provides. We can live that life because He has made it possible for us to live that life if we go His way. We can glorify God. That's what Jesus is doing. He's going to glorify God the Father. The goal is to, to go through this week, to continue to train His disciples, to make contact with the people in the city who are there to cel celebrate Passover. He will complete the goal. He will be on the cross. He will be raised. But he is there in the city at this time specifically in order to accomplish the, the very things that God has given, his purpose for being here. To, and he's going to glorify God in the process. And as a result of this, there's life. There's life. Jesus is living it out. He has life within himself, and he can give life to others. He provides that as he lives this life out, and it's transformational. The life that he gives is transformational. It, it changes the person from the inside out. God's love is shed abroad in our hearts. It penetrates from, from our innermost being in through all that we are, through our soul and our psyche, through our brain, through our fingertips, it begins to make a way, its way through. The more we listen to God, the more we obey, the more we practice and train 
in righteousness, the more these things begin to take, take hold of our lives and we become more and more like Christ. We are made new in him. That's the process that's going on. There are consequences to those who have disobeyed. Jesus said he's not come to judge but to save the world, but there are consequences. Those who have rejected him, who will betray him, who have turned their back on him, who are just opportunists using him, they will be judged, and they will be judged by the truth that Jesus has proclaimed. That reality will happen. It's not happening right here, right now, but that thing will break through everyone's life, every person for all that they've done, all that they said, all of those areas of life will begin to uh, take hold in, in their lives and they will one day stand before the Lord, before His throne and face the judgment based on the things that Jesus has said and done. They are in His presence so they will be held accountable for this. There is also the reality that that God has given them in the word that they've already had access to. These are Jewish people who had access to the Hebrew scriptures, to the temple, to the prophets, to the teaching from all these ages. And they have turned their backs on that. Instead of loving God as they ought and loving others, they have decided to look out for themselves, to promote themselves, to, to lean on their own understanding and to go in a direction that will be... Uh, beneficial to themselves, they think. In the end, it will cost them, and they will be judged for it. But those who come to Jesus, those who go His way, can learn from Him. They can behold what He's doing and what He's teaching and how He's accomplishing these things and go beyond circumstances. In the middle of a pandemic, people can go beyond the circumstances. When they're facing financial ruin or difficulty keeping a business afloat, they, they trying to just get food on the table. There are problems. People are at each other in, in a household or within a family or difficulties in relationships with friends and, and uh, a breakdown in relationships in a community. All those things can be, can be part of this. Overcoming the stress, overcoming fears, that's what Jesus has done. He said, well, so should my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? And he's saying, no, that's not how I should pray. I came here for this very reason. Father, bring glory to your name. That's the goal. Bring glory to your name. How should you pray? Father, save me from this hour. Or I was made for such a time as this. Father, bring glory to your name. Bring glory to your name. Use me. Use the things that I am. Use all my resources. Use my time. Use my creativity. Use my money. Use my effort. Use my heart, my voice to glorify you. Whatever that means. Maybe it means we actually get sick with this virus. Maybe it, it means not only we get sick, but perhaps die. Can we glorify God in the midst of that? Yeah. Yeah, Jesus did exactly that. We can do that. There's no fear in death when we know Him, when we walk with Him, when we are listening to Him. Jesus goes beyond the circumstances. He is proving that as we go through John chapter 12, and we benefit from observing, beholding, and we may become like Him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank You for giving us a chance to look into the Scriptures, to observe Jesus in these moments, these tough, tough times. Lord, help us to pay attention, to practice the things that He has shown us, that He has taught us, that He has revealed to us. Lord, help us to listen for your voice. It may sound like thunder, but there you are, making yourself known. Lord, that we would live in such a way that we would glorify you, we would accomplish that which you've called us to do, that we would live beyond the circumstances, recognizing that you brought us to this time, this point in history, exactly where we are for your glory, for your purposes. And Lord, we desire to honor you. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. 
Amen.